Welcome to the live stream of the podcast, and thank you for hanging out with us on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Joining us today, we have Ernest White II, host of the hit PBS travel series, Fly Brother. If you haven't watched it yet, you are missing out. And here in New York City, it airs on Saturdays and Sundays on WNYE, so please make sure you check it out. Now, today's episode is brought to us by Barbone Men's Grooming Products. They make the best men's natural grooming products that are cruelty-free, paraben-free, and vegan. Now, you get a 10% discount when you use the promo code PODCAST, and you can find them over at barbonelife.com. That's B-A-R-B-O-N-L-I-F-E.com. Now, Ernest, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thank you for having me, Rob. I really appreciate being here, my brother. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to have you here. Um, we were talking before about your show, and yes. I love it because I feel great after watching an episode. Mm. I feel connected to people. The way you tell stories is is really amazing. And what was the thought or how was the show conceived? Because it's an excellent show. So thank you, Ben. Thank you. Well, I initially had a blog a long time ago. It was called Fly Brother, which was all about international travel from a multicultural perspective, from a Black perspective. And it was out at a time when there weren't many uh, blogs or other forms of travel media that talked about what it was like to be a person of color traveling around the world. And I, the, the blog had some traction. I had uh, interest from, from different uh, different aspects of, of the media industry. And uh, a buddy of mine from college said, hey man, I am now involved in a, a small startup cable network and we'd like to commission you to do a travel series, man. You're a great storyteller, you've been a lot of places. Uh, I had had a, a couple of uh, experiences with television before I was uh, on a, a couple of travel channel series as a talking head. And so eventually he convinced me to do it. I uh, And I kind of leveraged my friendships and connections with uh, folks in the travel industry, having worked as a journalist for about 15 years at that point. And we were able to get a little bit of funding and the alignment happened. And when we started trying to figure out, you know, what our niche would be, you know, obviously you have Anthony Bourdain, at the, who at the time was still going very strong and, you know, uh, kind of covering the food angle. And I mean, I can eat, but I'm not a foodie in that way. And so we had to try to figure out, you know, what would be interesting to an audience. I love architecture, but, you know, that's a nerd passion. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I have to like think what could be authentic and engaging to the audience. And I was like, you know what, honestly, man, after all of these years of traveling, uh, I had been to say to 70 some odd countries, I've lived in five. And I'm not saying that uh, to kind of hold that over people. I was always trying to encourage people to go out and, and, and see the world and be a part of the world. So even if you've only been to one country or you've never been, it's still not too late even now. And so, you know, with all of that life experience, one thing I noticed was that I've always been able to really connect with people and the technology that we have now allows us to stay in contact. So whereas before you had to send a postcard or a letter or you you know would spend six dollars a minute on a long distance phone call a couple times a year a year now we've got WhatsApp and of course email and social media to stay engaged and we can have our global community on the phones with us. And so that was what I felt like would be the most again, authentic to me and my experiences and that I would like to share with others. So that's how the show came about. We uh, started filming and while we were in the midst of filming season one, that small startup network went out of business. And uh, we were a cart without a horse for a little while, but just through a series of conversations with people in the travel industry, I ended up being connected with Northern California Public Media, which is in the PBS fold. And that's how we ended up having the show that came out this summer. Now, uh, where did that passion for traveling come from? Man, it was always in me, I think. I remember being a very young kid, 
interested in languages and cultures, flags, maps. I was always a geography nerd. I grew up in Florida and back then in the 80s, you could go to Disney World for like $20, $21 if you were a Florida resident. And we would go to Epcot. That was my favorite uh, uh, theme park of all of the, the attractions at Disney World. And it was because you could go to these different pavilions that represented different countries from around the world and you can engage with people and, and just, I don't know, connect with something new and different. And my folks were teachers. And I always remember, you know, we had books around the house. They encouraged my reading. And, and, and I also watched them engage with people. You know, we'd be out and about. And they'd just have conversations with people who looked different than us. And, and uh, so for me, there was always kind of this innate desire to learn and to connect, coupled with a very supportive environment in that regard. And uh, one of the biggest things was, uh, I, I grew up in church like every other good Southern boy. Mm -hmm. And I remember the uh, wife of the minister, Mrs. Estelle McKissick, who was a teacher herself, she had given me a book for Christmas called Free Stuff for Kids. And in that book, you could order like toys and trinkets and that kind of thing. But you could also order brochures and pamphlets from the convention and visitors bureaus, from the tourism boards of different countries and cities around the world. And that's what I ordered. I collected airline timetables and, and anything that was transportative, I collected maps, all of these things. And so that's kind of, that's what got me started, man. Nice. Now, what was the first country you ever visited? The Bahamas, which when you're a Floridian, really, that's like going to another county uh, of Florida. But I, my first trip abroad was to the Bahamas when I was maybe uh, 12 or 13 years old. We flew from Fort Lauderdale to Freeport. That was like a 20 minute flight. <laughs> Um, but after that, uh, when I was 16, I went to Sweden as a foreign exchange student. And that came about because I remember we were walking through the mall one day and I saw a table for the Youth for Understanding International Exchange. And I went up, got information, and then asked my parents if we could host a foreign exchange student. And they were like, no, <laughs> but you can go. And so I ended up, <laughs> when I was 16, I went to Sweden. This was 1994. So I'm telling my age, but before <laughs> the internet, uh, I, I went to Sweden. I was there. It was the summer. The World Cup was happening in the U.S. I was out there, uh, stayed with a family for six weeks the summer between my junior and senior years of high school. And it was life changing, man. I, I've never stopped traveling since. Now, what what was your first impression of Sweden? What, did you fall in love with it right away? Was it different? Was it the same? It was a little of both, you know, it was a little, it was different and it was the same. I was not in Stockholm, the capital. Uh, I, I spent a week there at the, the, the tail end of the trip, but for the most part, I was in a small town called Ronel, which was outside of Luleå in the far, far north of Sweden. For people of a certain age, the only, the, the most famous person from that region was Maud Adams the model and actress from Octopussy. Uh -huh. And um, the I, I remember uh, that I was there in the summer. It's so far north, you could just drive over to Finland uh, and you could drive up to the Arctic Circle. And so because of that, you know, the, the sun would only set underneath the horizon for maybe an hour, two hours at most during the summer. And that plus the mosquitoes that kind of flourished in the marshy areas. Uh -huh. It did remind me a little bit of Florida uh -huh. in that it was flat, there were mosquitoes and it was sunny uh, all day, but there was, I don't know, it was just different enough. You know, I mean, they're human beings. Everybody wants the same thing in life to be seen, to be empowered and to be loved. And I, I know, I, I felt that, but there was also something uh, of an adventurousness you know, of an exploration, even though, yeah, we're talking about the 90s, it was modern times, but um, I still felt like I was going someplace new. I was experiencing something that was very much outside of my normal day to day, even if it was just um, being in a place where people didn't speak English as their primary language, you know? Um, and so that desire to kind of show up somewhere and be new and to and I, I was not aware of this at the time, obviously I was a kid, but now just looking back, you know, 
it's finding those things that make us similar. It's looking for ourselves in others that I really, really enjoy. And uh, so, yeah, man. <laughs> and then sometimes on these trips, you end up making amazing friendships that can last a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, really, it's just a matter of being open, you know, being vulnerable, being permeable. And what I mean is I don't mean to uh, that you shouldn't have your your value system that, you know, you should, but I, I'm Southern, man. I was raised to be polite to people. I was raised to hold doors, to be chivalrous, which of course, you know, has some misogyny mixed into it. But the idea of being um, uh, caring about people, being community minded, that's how I was raised. So it wasn't, it was natural for me to go to a different place and be that same way, you know, kind of be concerned about how other people are, are engaging and interacting. And so to uh, once you just you look at people, you smile and you say hello, that opens things up for interaction. You know, it opens things up for potential. And, not, you know, most of the time that potential has been pleasant. And again, you know, you never know, but 20, 30 years later, I'm still in contact with my original host family. Uh, we lost contact for a while. They found me on Facebook. I went back and visited and that was phenomenal. Of all the countries that I've been to, man, I have continued to just meet amazing people who may have nothing in common with me other than the fact, again, that we're just all here trying to do the best that we can do. And when you have that attitude, when you don't go with, uh, from a place of fear or like, oh, they're, they, they, this othering, they're going to think this way or that way or whatever. You know, it, when you go recognizing that people are just people, you find these phenomenal connections. They find you actually, I don't even have to look. Now, so that first experience was like, I got to keep doing this. Is that what it was like? Man, definitely. And after that, I remember coming back to the US after that trip. And any time I had the opportunity to try to travel, if it was with my Spanish class to Mexico, I remember they had a trip to, to Merida in the uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. My dad didn't allow me to go, but I, I I was always looking for opportunities to go someplace. And then my next international trip was when I was in college and I went to the Dominican Republic as a part of a study abroad program. And that was when I got the idea really to live abroad. You lived in, in Latin America. Uh, you lived in um, Brazil? I, I lived Colombia? in Colombia for four years, and I lived in Brazil for three years. Where, where in Colombia? Colombia is one of my favorite places. Uh, Bogota is, is just an amazing city, and yes. I love it that it's like in the mountains. I, I can't explain mm -hmm. it. Like You're in the center of Bogota, and then you have these amazing mountains all around you, and it's like cloudy and misty, and it's yes. just a phenomenal place. Where in Colombia super verdant it's so i lived there as an educator i lived in barranquilla and i lived in bogota and in bogota i was teaching english and social sciences at a university but i was living in the central historical colonial era area and that was called uh la candelaria and i was like maybe a half mile from the mountain that rose above the city. There was a range of mountains running along uh, the, the east of the city and they were just green forested. You know, it looked a lot like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and, and I was right there underneath the shadow of this kind of large um, and protective, you know, kind of landform. I'm from Florida. So yes, I've been a lot of places, but I grew up in a very flat environment. So to be in a place like Bogota, which it, the city itself is in a valley, so it's flat, but it's got these huge mountains on the side of it. It's quite striking and impressive. And it's 8 million people. So like you said, like it's, it's a big city that's got a lot happening. Yeah, uh, and so, yeah man. all the buildings are like brick, which is super interesting. Yeah. There's just so much brick in, in Bogota. And yeah, like... Uh, you, with the mountains, you know, you're you're on the plane and you're looking out and you see just a whole line of mountains and then like the the city of it's yes. just an, it's an impressive experience just from the minute you're on the plane and you get to the area and then it's like here's a city surrounded by mountains. It's yes it's beautiful. And then I hear people complain about the altitude. I never had a problem with the altitude, mm -hmm. but um it's just super impressive. And then um 
the the colonial cities like Cartagena is also I don't yes. know if you had a chance to go there, but that was yeah. amazing. I lived about well. two hours away by car from Cartagena. Uh, the town I was in, Barranquilla, Shakira's hometown, so their biggest claim to fame. Uh, it is kind of an industrial city in the north of the country. Uh, and so I taught at a university while I was there, uh, Universidad del Norte, shout outs. And I also taught at a high school too. And so just working with um, a lot of great kids who were just trying to find their way in life and needed a little bit of guidance. They gave me hell, but I gave it right back to them. <laughs> and um, so I come from a family of teachers, man, and, and, and uncles and aunts and all of it. So we don't play. That's our family business. Nice. <laughs> nice. So then from, from Colombia, you, you also lived in, was it Brazil? Did you live in Brazil? Yes, for a while? I lived in Brazil. I lived in Brasilia, with the capital city, uh, for a few months. Then I moved to Sao Paulo, where I worked as a journalist uh, and editor at Time Out magazine. So, if you're in New York, obviously you know Time Out very well. Uh, we had a version of it in Sao Paulo in English. Uh, and my, I was one of the section editors. It was my responsibility to find out everything that was happening and the nightlife scene, uh, the music scene, uh, just museums, uh, oh my God, the gay and lesbian, um, tra the travel section, those are my sections, man. And I was there from 2010 to 2012 at the height of this last economic boom for Brazil. So it was just a phenomenal time to be there. And for me, it was like, that was a New York experience for me. It was like, you're, you're, it's the exhilaration of the city. The cultural life was just insane. Uh, and so, yeah, man, that and Sao Paulo remains to this day one of my favorite cities on the planet. And I talk about it like it's that ex-spouse that when you see again, you remember why you got together. <laughs> and you also remember why you got divorced, but it's all, it's still all love, you know. Like that's how I am with Sao Paulo, which which is is a great segue to to my next question. Of all the places you've visited, um, what's that one place that stole your heart? And I guess maybe it's 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 Brasilia um, or Sao Paulo, because you know, for me, there's there's places where I've gone and they like stay with you forever. Uh, something about the atmosphere, something about walking down a street that's not uh, common to 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 where you're from, that yes. stays with you forever. Uh, what if if there's a city or a place that comes to mind that you're like, you know what, this is an unforgettable place that I am connected to for the rest of my life? South Africa, uh, South Africa, man. You know, Sao Paulo was a great marriage. Um, South Africa is the love of my life. And uh, it's a place where I have had phenomenal and incredibly deep experiences with the place, with people. Um, it is a, a place of great uh, possibility. Um, they've got challenges in their society, but it's a, a place that I, it, places are like people, you know, just because I have an experience in a place doesn't mean that you'll have it and vice versa. But for me, South Africa is very much a home space. It is very much a space that when I go to it, I always yearn to return uh, before I even leave. Um, and yeah, that's all I can say, man. It, it's just, it's beautiful. Um, and mm, my heart is always full whenever I think about it. Was it the the people? Was it the food? Was it the scenery? It, what it's about all of it? that. And I would say that I also had, you know, just some personal growth experiences while I was there. Um, and I've had that. It, my, my life is all about growth and expansion. Everybody's life is, is about that on some level where you go and then you you learn a lot about yourself. And sometimes, you know, it's painful and other times it's it's beautiful. Uh, it's always beautiful. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had phenomenal growth experiences in Brazil and in, in India uh, and in a few other places. But South Africa, for me, uh, I just remember my first trip there. Uh, it's really hard to, to articulate in words. I just remember the feeling of, um, of presence, of, 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 again, that home feeling. And, and so when you go there, when you, when you visit, you know, the food is incredibly fresh. They, uh, things are organic. I mean, the, the, the 
meat, the vegetables. You don't have to be into you can you can be vegetarian and vegan and actually still uh, find delicious, very well prepared, fresh foods. Um, the beauty of their exchange rate is if you're coming with dollars or pounds or euros, you're doing really, really well. You can have a luxurious experience there for uh, a, a, a little bit of money. And the people to me are super engaging. They are, they are reminiscent of Brazilians as a society to me in the sense that you know, there's always a party going on in a lot of ways. There's always, they're, they're, they're just engaging people. Like you'll get into a conversation and you'll, you know, they'll, they'll welcome you and they'll want to know about you and want to show you a good time, but also they want you to feel welcome. And that's, and you get that in a lot of places as well. It just so happens that uh, again, South Africa stole my heart, man. I don't know. <laughs> Was it what you expected? Like, because I remember, no. you know, in the '90s, you know, when apartheid was still part of the culture. Yes. Um, it was, you know, what you saw in the news. Um, you know, it, it, it you wouldn't think of it as it being a, a friendly and welcoming place necessarily because of what you saw in the news. And sometimes the news could be a little tainted. But a hundred percent of the time, what, what was your mindset in going in there? Like, what, what was your mindset when you were on your way there? Well, I will say this. I, I, I am not, I'm Southern again, which means I come from a region that had its own form of apartheid. I mean, we've had apartheid here in the US. We just called it segregation or Jim Crow laws or, 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 or redlining. You know, that's an example of all that stuff. And it, it's happened in our society, which is one of the reasons why I was really able to connect with South Africa because they're, you know, maybe 20 years kind of newer to an open society than we are. But let's not forget, okay, they end, apartheid ended in 1994. Martin Luther King was shot in 1968. Um, that was, uh, sorry, yeah, that was nine years before I was born. Nine years before I was born. So we're not talking ancient history over here. And so to go to South Africa, which again, mirrors the South where we are very polite, even as we uh, <laughs> struggle with some of our challenges, that's how I felt, you know, did I experience what I would consider to be racism in South Africa? Absolutely. I've experienced it in Colombia. I've experienced it in Brazil and in uh, Germany, you know? However, I experienced more opportunities for connection. I've experienced more people who, again, were very interested in having me see their hearts in these places. And what I mean by that is, just in terms of you, 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 you get into a conversation with someone and they'll ask, you know, how, how are you feeling being here? Are you having a good time? How can I make your stay better? You know, and I don't mean someone working at a hotel. I mean, someone that you'll meet sitting next to you at a restaurant. You know, that's what I loved about South Africa uh, was that people really were engaged, were enrolled in my happiness as a person. Wow, impressive. Now, of all the places you've visited of all the different types of food that you've tried around the world. What's like the one type of food that you could say, you know what? I could eat this every day. Oh man. <laughs> Curry. And I'll say, I don't care if it's Thai or Indian. I, <laughs> I can throw down with some curry anytime. Um, but I would say there are certain places where I've had surprising culinary experiences. Georgia, the country of Georgia, which is a, you know, formerly part of the Soviet Union. Tajikistan, which is also formerly part of the Soviet Union. Now, Georgia, they cook with a lot of butter. Mm. And so like, you know, they it, they really know how to use seasonings and, and, and you just, they're on the Silk Road. Both Georgia and Tajikistan actually were on the Silk Road. So they were on this major trading route from between East and West that was, you know, kind of heavily trafficked hundreds of years ago, which means you've got a lot of cultural mixing that happened a long time ago. And it still exists in a way in terms of how people look, their phenotypes, but also their uh, the, the food has these elements, a little bit from India, a little bit from China, a little bit from Persia and Iran, and a little bit from, from Europe. And it's all kind of thrown in there in a way that just, it, it, it's, it's delicious. Uh, and even though you had like this Soviet 
kind of uh, repression happening, even culturally, for much of the 20th century, those culinary skills are still there. And so I remember being in Georgia and eating kachapuri, which is kind of like a, uh, it's like, a, they, they call it Georgian pizza, but I, it's not identical to pizza, but it is bread and cheese and butter and, Yes, you need a wheelbarrow to get to your next location <laughs> after you eat it, but it is uh -huh. so delicious. Uh -huh. And then in Tajikistan, simple, but delicious bread. Uh, they put dill on everything, which is wow. a, that's a, a seasoning that I love. And, uh, and yeah, so, you know, Central Asia is very surprising when it comes to, uh, and, and I say surprising not for people who are from there. It's not surprising to them that they've got good food. It's surprising to those of us from like the U.S. that don't know much about these places. It seems like that region of the world doesn't get that much of attention uh, exactly. for some reason. You know, again, have, like I said, having been on the Silk Road, they were once the, at the center of the world. And then having been at the back of the, the Russian and then the Soviet empires, you know, they were so isolated and impoverished uh, for, for much of the 20th century. And so, they, you know, a lot of the, those countries, Georgia did a really good job uh, in terms of opening themselves up to the world and bringing in tourists, uh, as did Uzbekistan. Uh, they've done really well. They were doing really well last year before everything kind of shut down uh, in terms of their tourism and their numbers. Um, and so the countries individually are working to really try and like show the world what they've got. Europeans have been going there for a long time, Germans particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the opportunity to help update a guidebook to the country of Tajikistan a few, maybe four years ago now. And it was the only English language guidebook to Tajikistan. Germany, German was the only other language that had a guidebook just to Tajikistan. And uh, so, you know, it's it's really interesting when you, you see that we're kind of latecomers in a lot of ways when we yeah, travel. Yeah. <laughs> now, who's got the best coffee? I know yeah, that's a tough one because so many, so many different countries make amazing coffee. Yes. But You've I would say Ethiopia, of, man. Ethiopia, Ethiopia, right? At least in my and and, and I, I will put an asterisk because I know that Yemen also has really good coffee. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yes, uh, I know that. Uh, and they're right next. To yeah, Yem, Yemen. Um, so I think they were probably maybe one of the original yes. countries thousands of years ago that that were trading coffee. Yes, and. Absolutely. It's a little piece of history that that um, doesn't get talked about much, but right, right. I actually uh, got a chance to experience Yemeni coffee in San Francisco, where I was living recently. Uh, they've got a Yemeni community there. Actually, uh, I, I, I befriended the owner of a restaurant there, Mo's Cafe, Mo, short for Mohammed, a uh, common <laughs> name, but Mo was from Yemen, and uh, we just got to talking. And the, the, what I loved about both Yemeni coffee as well as Ethiopian coffee, uh, it's just, it is strong, man. It's fuerte. And I don't know if it's because there might be a little bit of cat up in there, but <laughs> like, it's just, <laughs> you, get, it, it, you, you get, it wakes up. you up. It wakes you up and, and you, you, you feel a little bit invincible. And uh, that's actually, I enjoy that feeling because I can get a lot of work done. Sure. Or sure. it's great for a pre-workout uh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it gets the it gets the creative juices going like it's Absolutely. it's impressive yeah. it's yes. impressive so now for someone who loves to travel and connect with people and we talked a little bit about the show before where you just feel great after watching an episode of of your show where you i, I feel it's based around friendship and about and uh, making new friends yes. and connections with people who who uh, are not similar to you from other parts of the world. Mm. How do you now during a pandemic um, travel? Like, is it is it something that we should put on hold? If someone really loves to travel, should they wait it out or what? What would you do? Are, are you still traveling during? I have traveled. Yes, uh, I went to Mexico uh, in July and August, and I'm now currently in Canada. Um, I do the best that I can when it comes to PPE. I always wear a mask when I'm out in public. I'm not a virologist 
or an epidemiologist. I'm not even a scientist, except if, you know, I'm a political scientist because that's what I got my undergrad degree in. And so knowing what I do know and knowing how smart I am about the topics that I know and how people don't know a, a doggone thing about what I know makes me know that I don't know anything about like, <laughs> diseases, <laughs> communicable diseases. So I wash my hands, I wear the mask. However, I'm also living my life in a way that I can straddle that line. You know, I try to be respectful of other people and uh, I haven't seen my folks in a while, you know, love them, we talk frequently, but they're elderly. You know, my mother's 83, my dad's 74, until I'm sure that going to visit them will not be problematic for them, I'm not going to risk it. And so saying that, when I've traveled, I remember flying Aeromexico, the uh, you know Aeromexico, the Mexican airline. They had uh, hand sanitizer when you walked up to the the plane. There was a, a some kind of a disinfectant that you had to step in. They also the flight attendants, of course, had gloves. They had masks and they had face shields. They sat people without uh, the, with spaces in between them. This was back in July. I don't know if their policies are the same, but I really felt like they had done a solid job at trying to make sure that people were protected. You know, we've got to be engaging. Human beings want to connect with each other. We've also got to earn a living. And so I recognize that, you know, some of us actually do need to be out in the world. If you're interested in traveling, I think you should consider it, but I think you should do so in a way that is as safe as you can. You know, I don't believe in careless behavior. Uh, I know it exists, but I, I just feel like you're only hurting yourself. Uh, so, you know, it, it like anything, you, you're asking people to have common sense. Yeah. It's not common. <laughs> Sadly. Yeah. So was there less people traveling uh, when you sure definitely no. back in July, the, I, I felt that um, I think now uh, especially as we've kind of moved into the fall, there's been, much, especially domestically, you know, there's been many more people traveling around uh, the U.S. Uh, flights are a little bit uh, more, a little bit fuller. Uh, it's also because airlines have started, have trimmed their schedules. They uh, they stopped flying as often, so the frequencies are down. And now a lot of those furloughs and layoffs have actually come into effect because there mm -hmm. was no uh, way to kind of, there was no governmental support for the airlines. And so because of that, it means that flights are going to be fuller. It means that you're going to have less flight attendants uh, and, and other crew members to kind of attend to you, which means service levels are going to drop. Surely there'll be the, the requisite number for a safety perspective, but in terms of service, that won't be a thing that you should even consider. Uh, and the other thing of course is clearly, social distancing is challenging when you're in an airplane. It's challenging when you're in an airport, you know? And so if you're immunocompromised, I certainly wouldn't suggest doing much air travel. Uh, however, if you have a vehicle, you know, get out and get around, you know, go out into nature if you can do it. If you can do it at times when the crowds are, are not going to be as high. You know, Tuesday morning is a great time to go to a park. Uh, and so I, it's it, that's coming from a place of great privilege, you know, because a lot of people still have a nine to five job. Many people have service jobs that they can't just take off, they have to do in person. And so I recognize that I'm speaking from a place of privilege and I'm encouraging people to do that. But the thing about privilege is if you've got it, it you should be using it for good. Sure. And one of the things that people appreciated when I was traveling was that I was uh, in helping businesses continue to operate. You know, I choose to um, order from restaurant from local restaurants uh, at least a couple times a week mm -hmm. more than I would have ordinarily because I'm trying to do my little part, my little one drop of water in the ocean to help businesses stay open. And I always give them a bigger tip uh, just because I know that they, people are struggling. Sure. And yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's my way of kind of helping things out. Yeah, no. And that's great. And, and that, that energy, right. That you talked about doing, doing good, um, and connecting with people is, is something that's definitely well portrayed on, on the series. And I think it is important to tip well, right. And these are people that are working 
through a pandemic to, to bring us food. And it's almost like they're putting their, their, their health at risk to, to, you know, provide us with a meal. And, um, I think it's, I think it's really important. One of the things that I've noticed was also, it seems like there's a, at least for a short period of time. And I don't know if it, I haven't had a chance to check, but there was like good bargains out there, uh, for traveling, uh, during the summer. I remember, um, receiving a couple of ads from, well, this was Las Vegas, right? Uh, a night at, at the win for like 89 bucks. And I was like, what? <laughs> 89 bucks for the win. Man, yeah. Like they really were trying to get bodies in those rooms. Uh, the flights were also cheap to a lot of places. And you they, you know, again, they're 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 trying to survive as entities. And they also have these insanely flexible change, you know, situations where you don't have to pay a change fee and, and or you get to uh, you know have a ticket available to you for the next year. So I would definitely consider those those options. You know, it is good to take advantage of any deals that show up because you're also helping to again keep those companies afloat. Sure. And I think it's a good philosophy if you enjoy it and you're gonna take the safety precautions, then you should live your life and not let these things uh limit you. I think that's a good good philosophy, a good way to, to view things. And now I wanted to move to like this fun part of <laughs> the show that we do All right, where, <laughs> so you got two options, right? We can take a, would you rather question? And these are completely random. Uh, I have, uh, I have them here and I'm just going to pull one out or, um, just a random regular question. So you want to take a, would you rather, or would you rather just Take one from the regular pile of random questions. I say regular pile of random regular questions. Pile. Okay. Yeah, man. Well, here we go. Would you rather? Excuse me, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So here we go. I got it right here. Um, what is your guilty pleasure? Oh man. Is this a family show? No, uh, no, no, no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good love making, but I, I I don't feel guilty <laughs> about that. So uh, let me think of something else. Uh, guilty pleasure, man. Yeah, you should never feel guilty about good love making, right? That's uh, agreed, agreed. That's like a agreed. good. That's like a good thing, right? It's healthy. It's healthy. <laughs> um, I would say guilty pleasure for me would be something banal. It's like rice and bread. Eating uh -huh. rice and bread just makes me feel so good. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> those are things that are not really, when you're trying to keep it, you know, sure. trim, uh, especially over a certain age, those are not recommended, uh, you know, items. But, oh, man. Yeah, I mean, we have good because of the carbs. But, yeah, th that's something that, you know, you could have with anything, right? You could have any meal with a side of rice. I mean, that's... You know what? I just thought of an even better guilty pleasure. Bacon. Oh, bacon I love bacon. It's meat candy. <laughs> I could be vegan with bacon. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's just that bacon goes with everything. I think there's there isn't anything you can't add bacon to. I mean, What's I've that? seen people add bacon to the top of uh, cupcakes. So I was gonna. So my like perfect sweet savory combination is bacon cheesecake. <laughs> you can, no fruit topping or anything. No. And, and actually, with the, if you can get it without the graham cracker or crust as well, just the cheesecake and some bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I could have bacon on everything: breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Ernest, let's do let's do one more of these random. All right. Okay, here go. we go. Okay. When you die, which we hope it's not anytime soon, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh God. For having lived a phenomenal life. Nice. Yeah. And it's because it's it's yeah, you know, it's it's for me, you know, I'm 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 living a phenomenal life because it's enjoyable to me but it also gives other people permission to do the same thing. You know, that's that's the biggest part. It's not just cause, oh, I get to say that I've, you know, uh, 
been to the top of the you know highest mountain in Mongolia in 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 January and took a great picture, which I did. But it's about saying like, do it too, man. You got like get out into the world. I want to see more people engaging, you know. Um, and 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 when I say that too, I mean not just in travel. I'm talking about in everything and every. I'm talking about the romance of life, you know that enjoying great music and intimacy with people. And, and I think we were talking about this before, like a great dinner with folks, that's intimacy. It's not just sexual intimacy. You know, it's a good hug from your friends and having phenomenal conversation where you're really connecting on something that you feel deeply about. It's, you know, opening up your heart to that person that you really do want to have a, a relationship with and, and, and working through the fear that you're going to be rejected or abandoned or betrayed and all of these other things. And it, none of it's easy, but it is so worth it, man. And so for me to live a phenomenal life is just to show other people like, we have to do this. This is what allows us to, to really engage with people. And this is what allows us to feel good about ourselves. That's how we find, get to world peace. That's how we get to like not having people fighting all the time over foolishness. Because when you feel good about yourself, you're, mm -hmm. it, 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 you exude that, you know? And, 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 and other people will start to engage with it too. And it's contagious. When, when you surround yourself with people who have that philosophy, who have that mentality, it rubs off on you. Just yes. And the opposite is just is just as true. Sure. If sure. you hang around with people who are not like that, um, they just kind of bring you down. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, it's, it's important to to also surround yourself with with positive people who have that type of philosophy. And because we're here for for not that long, if you really think about it, it's, it's so all. It's a blip. It's it is it is and and you're basically if we wanted to call it you're you're living the dream like what does that feel well, I'm like? living a dream I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the dream but it's definitely a dream um, I, I mean is there anything left that that you haven't done yet or oh, that you yeah, that need to lot. do or a place that you haven't visited yet that you're like I gotta go there. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, I would say I don't have that same kind of burning desire that I did before. So, sure, there are places I'd love to get to, Nigeria, Greenland, uh, Antarctica, uh, excuse me, Sri Lanka again, you know. Uh, so there are lots of places that are still kind of uh, that call to me. But I would say that um, for me, now I've kind of leveled up in other ways. I'm right now the the CEO and founder of a new television film film television and digital media studio called Presidio Pictures. The focus is on BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and over 60 narratives to help amplify voices that have always been there, but have not had the kind of mainstream shine that they deserve. And so now I'm not only working on season two of Fly Brother. I'm also working on a, a Canadian version of the show. I'm working on a couple of scripted series, a documentary following in the footsteps of Langston Hughes through the Soviet Union. There's so many projects and things and stories that need to be told that are within me. And so that's kind of where I'm, where I, my, my focus is right now. So and it, I could do that until I croak. And <laughs> I think I probably will. Yeah. <laughs> And when you do these things that you enjoy, it it doesn't feel like work almost. I don't know. Like a lot of times it doesn't. I would say I'm having a mix of exhilaration and exhaustion. And I say that because there is a lot to do. There are always emails to respond to. There's calls to respond to. There's organizing that has to happen. And, uh, and so, but um, I gladly do them because I've got the passion for it and my passion and purpose are aligned. And so there's a there there the the lifting gets heavy sometimes. I you know, I can't it is not always uh rainbows and unicorns and I will also say there's a lot of internal work that has to happen. You know, I do a lot of I meditate. I kind of uh allow myself to feel things that come up. So if it's fear, if it's anxiety, if it's, you know, heartbreak and rejection and all of these other things, if they show up, I give them space to, to, to be and do what they need to do. And they dissipate that much more quickly 
than if I was trying to repress them. And no, I'm not supposed to feel that way. And I have to be, you know, either strong against it or happy all the time. No, I just allow myself to be what, you know, is there. And that's not always easy because we do want to feel good all the time. We want to distract and all these other things. But I recognize that as I do that, I get to move much more quickly. I get to be much more nimble, more agile, because I'm not loaded down with baggage as much as I used to be. Uh, and so all of these things kind of let me um, engage with this work with a passion where it become you can find enjoyment in it. So it's like accepting that there are going to be down moments, but it's part of the journey. And oh, I think it's, it's almost human nature to... To once we get through these tough moments or, or we come across them, that people become discouraged and yeah. feel, and like you said, it, it you feel like it's supposed to be rainbows and sunny days all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's not always the case, but we have to understand that it's part of the journey. So long as, you know, we keep an eye on, on what the end goal is. That and you will get through it. That's the thing that, that's where people get caught up. It's where I used to get caught up. You know, in just the, oh God, the despair of like, this sucks, this is crap. Things aren't going the way I want them to go. The relationship that I wanted, it, 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 it fell apart. There's, you know, whatever it is, my money isn't right. You know, like all of these things, my health, you know, whatever it is, it shows up for you. Recognize that there's always the other side that you will come out of one way or the other. And in that, you know, it's a part of that is recognizing the blessings. You know, if you're not, if things aren't right and you don't have money, but you've got your health, well, like, amen. You know what I mean? Because that means that you've got something that is, is, is money can't even buy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I think us, us able bodied folk really lose sight of sometimes. You know, it's like it could totally be worse. If we've got the use of our limbs and our intelligence and intellect, like we've been set up for success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you've got your health, you're able to do the things you need to do to get the money you need. If, if that's, if that's what you feel. So yeah, health 100%. is, is super, super important. And uh, I always, I guess, is what oh I'm yeah. Saying, you know. And I attest to that through, through personal things that I've gone through. Uh, and we've talked about it many times on the show. Um, two years ago, I had this uh, cancer scare where the doctor it, it's it's so life-changing when you hear your doctor say had you not come in to get screened and you waited till you're 50 when you're supposed to come in to get screened you would have made it to 50. oh man rob i'm so happy that that happened and that you were called to do this and it's insane it's insane yeah. to, to to hear that but it also opens your eyes to it changes your perspective basically sure, is, is how sure. I see it. And, and then you're like, how could I be so lucky? It's like being lucky or it, so many things go through your mind at that moment. And you're like, I got to do something with my life because yes. that's really a second chance. And I tell my friends, yes. um, I basically have two birthdays. I August 6th when I was mm. born and February 13th, when mm. I went through this procedure that they removed the cancerous tumor from my intestines. The so, day before Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's crazy. So it was like, uh, I have two birthdays. And that's when yeah. the doctor was like, you know, you're lucky <laughs> that you're here. But you know what, man? You, 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 there's, you've got something to give the world. You are needed here, you know? And that was something to activate that in you. You know, it was something to catalyze this creative, generative energy that you've got now. So, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that that was brought to your attention in a, in a way to get you to where you are right now. But on some level, I mean, it was kind of inevitable. It would I'm a believer that everything is happening the way it's supposed to. And so that happened to spur you to go get tested to, and then to, to be of the mindset to get through it, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and it doesn't mean that people who don't get through it didn't have the right mindset. I'm not saying that. Right. I'm just saying right. that you were attuned to what you needed to be attuned to. And that's why we're having the conversation right now. Yeah. And to, to add to your philosophy, right. 
where my mind was like, well, if I'm here 40 years, 45 years, 47 years, whatever it is, I, mm. I want them to be or to have been worthwhile, right? Yeah. So it, it, it wasn't so much of like, I want to be here for a long time. I want the time that I am here for it to be quality time that I mm. that I uh, was able to spend time with friends and family and we enjoyed our company. We enjoyed the moments we were together and we did uh, the things we wanted to do and traveled and had fun, ate interesting things and just all that. So it, it became more of like a quality, right? Versus quantity. Sure, and, sure. Uh, so if I'm here another two years and they're great, I'm fine with that. If I'm here another 40, <laughs> I'm fine with that too. So, um, but it's it's interesting, and and that's why uh, I love I love your philosophy on life. I love your philosophy on travel, and I love what the show brings to people and how you feel at the end after watching the show. And and that's why I think everyone should should watch it and uh, just get submerged in different cultures and different foods and different people. Oh man, thank you, Rob. Like that. That's you make me feel, you know, humbled and also just very grateful that what I've kind of set out to do has been received. You know what I mean? Like you never know when you're going, when you're starting these things, how people are going to take it. But if you feel like you have ex had a, a transformative experience, then that's exactly what I, I set out to do. And I appreciate that that is what you've experienced. Um, and I did want to say, actually, in the New York area, we're also now, in addition to WNYE, we're on WNET as well. Nice. So, uh, NET, NIT, NET. 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 WNET. So uh, on Sunday, Saturday, Saturdays yes. at 7 30. And we'll, we, we will post uh, the links uh, in, in the show notes so that people can, can check it out. So, how can people, um, what are your social media? channels how can people follow you get in touch with you uh, we are on all the socials at fly brother so instagram is at fly brother uh facebook is the facebook page is fly brother fly we're on youtube at youtube.com slash c slash fly brother uh and then also the website is flybrother.net where you can go sign up for our flight list to find out more information about the series what's coming down the pike trips merchandise other things and uh yeah it's all over at Fly Brother. <laughs> awesome. Ernest, what a great time. Thank you so much for sharing your great stories. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to have you on the show. It was an honor and pleasure to be here, man. And I appreciate you and your audience for listening to me spout off for almost an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great time. And we'd love to have you back uh, when uh, season two is out and talk about all the places you, you're going to visit uh, in that season. Thank you so much, man. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for hanging out with us today. We will be back next Friday with another great guest. So you make sure you join us next Friday, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you very much. And I'll see you all in the promised land.